Welcome to One on One with Expert Flyer. We're back again and we are talking about 5G and uh, flight safety. Uh, our second guest today is Dean Greenblatt. He is an aviation attorney and former airline pilot. Welcome, Dean. Thank you, Lisa. Glad to be here. Great. So tell us a little bit about what you do in your role as an aviation attorney. Sure. So as an aviation attorney, I represent pilots, uh, aircraft owners, operators, and airlines in dealing with uh, the FAA and contracts and, and things of that nature. Great. So uh, we had a chance to talk uh, to a broadband expert. Actually, she's a senior reporter uh, for, for CNET, and that's her beat. Uh, her name is uh, Maggie Reardon. And, you know, she, she filled us in on a lot of the detail associated with uh, I guess you could say the FCC side. Uh, so I, I'm really looking forward to hear, hearing what you have to say, particularly as a, as a former pilot, uh, and how 5G may affect inconvenience uh, travelers uh, in, 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 the, in the near future. Um, and I guess the first thing that I, I wanted to cover with you is, you know, this, I guess, uh, <laughs> communication gap, for lack of a better description, between the FAA and the FCC. I mean, we have been talking about this for, for a number of years. Um, and now, right on the cusp of when this was supposed to be launched in January, all of a sudden there's this huge kerfuffle and, you know, the, the brakes have been put on 5G. What happened and why do you think it happened? Well, first of all, the, the FAA doesn't regulate electromagnetic spectrum, radio spectrum. And that's the purview of the Federal Communications Commission. And, and, and I don't want to repeat anything that Maggie may have already said, but the, the FCC auctions off spectrum because the, the radio waves and, and uh, the spectrum belongs to the people of the United States. Mm -hmm. So what happens is the FCC sells off, auctions a certain spectrum, and 5G spectrum was auctioned off uh, some time ago uh, to AT&T and Verizon to operate their 5G networks. But the FCC is supposed to cooperate with other um, governmental entities, and they do that through the uh, NTIA, which is the National Telecommunications Information Administration. It's an executive branch uh, uh, agency, and they're supposed to coordinate uh, the various users of the electromagnetic spectrum. Mm -hmm. And in this case, uh, you know, the, there there were some indications that there were problems, mm -hmm. but we also had an independent, private, uh, nonprofit uh, called the RTCA, the Radio Technical Commission for Aeronautics. And they came up with a report uh, after analyzing the issue and said that there were some radio altimeters that use uh, an area of the spectrum that is very close to the 5G spectrum that's mm -hmm. going to be put into place. And that could interfere with uh, the use of those radio altimeters. Now, was that was that back in, in December of 2020? Uh, I, I think it was in 2021, but it... it, it yeah, in that general within the, a year of the rollout, certainly. Right. Okay, so here we are. There, you know, that there was a House subcommittee hearing um, just last month, and you know, in large part, um, it was comprised of a lot of you know acknowledgement that the process may be a bit broken, um, and you know, lots of promises to to fix that, but. That's all well and good, but where do we stand right now in terms of travelers and regular old consumers who are thinking, oh my goodness, you know, gee, it's great to have this 5G phone, but, you know, when I go on vacation to the Bahamas, I don't want to land in the water. <laughs> right. Well, the, the important thing to keep in mind is that safety isn't going to be compromised. But anytime you, you need to enhance safety, it comes with a cost. And that cost is going to come to consumers, to travelers, or to people ship, uh, shipping goods on aircraft. Uh, so, uh, for example, if an airliner is equipped with a radio altimeter that requires to be 
um, uh, useful and, mm -hmm. and usable during a low visibility approach to a major airport. And it isn't allowed to be used for what we call cat two, three or auto land approaches. Um, then that airplane is going to have to carry additional fuel to get to a destination that has better weather and uh. they'll have to divert. So if you carry additional fuel on an airplane, it means you're not carrying as many passengers mm -hmm. or you're not being as fuel as efficient as you could be. Mm -hmm. And uh, that just increases costs for everybody. Mm. Okay. And not to mention uh, the replacement or retrofitting of these altimeters as well. So how long do you think it will take to kind of get this to where we're all feeling really good about it? Well, I think you can feel reasonably good about it now because the major vast majority of uh, transport category airplanes have been approved, meaning that the radio altimeters have been determined uh, to be hardened enough against the uh, uh, interference by 5G networks uh, that they can operate in areas where we have uh, potential for 5G interference. But there are a, a good percentage that have not been approved yet and mm -hmm. not been demonstrated to be resistant to it. Yeah, yeah. Well, let me ask you this as a, as a pilot. If you were piloting a, a plane and there was an issue, there, there was some interference caused by 5G, would you know? Before you even get to the point of determining whether or not um, you could recognize that there is a problem. Uh, and I think that you would be able to tell. Uh, you would know that whether or not that airplane's equipment is capable of operating in a, in a situation where there could be interference. So you, you simply wouldn't be able to operate that equipment in that environment. So you'd okay. be turning it off. And the problem is, is that equipment runs more than most people realize in a, in a modern airliner. Uh, not only does it assist in determining the uh, absolute distance between the aircraft and the ground on an approach mm -hmm. or a departure, but it's also tied in with several other safety systems on an aircraft, what we call TCAFs or TAWs, which are uh, collision avoidance systems with other aircraft or with the ground. Mm -hmm. So the radio altimeter is an important uh, link Mm -hmm. in the uh, uh, in the systems that needs to be operating and needs to be reliable. Okay, so on the planes uh, that have been tested and found that their altimeters are not up to snuff in relation to 5G, they, they basically are turned off. They are not able to be used by the pilot. Is that the case? In situations where the, the, those uh, radio altimeters would be required. Yes, that's true. Okay. All right. So in six months, um, the telecom companies, um, they're basically, their restrictions, um, which were tethered to, uh, I guess, erecting uh, towers uh, within a two mile vicinity of air, airports will be lifted, right? Um, and there's a good chance that. Um, the airlines are probably not going to be finished doing the work that they need to do to get the instrumentation, you know, right across their fleets. Is there anything that we need to know about this? Or, I mean, is it just all based on workarounds that the pilots are, you know, well versed in and um, it's more of an inconvenience rather than a safety issue? Well, I think the six months, and it's not really a, a federal restriction that they couldn't uh, erect the towers. It's an agreement by AT&T and Verizon that they're not going to do that in the vicinity of 88 airports, which are the highest traffic, uh, commercial traffic airports in the United States. But there's thousands of other airports where uh, they could be erecting these towers and the, there could be an effect on the utility of these radio altimeters. And what's more important is it's not just commercial air traffic that's affected uh, with respect to airliners going into your major hubs, New York, Boston, Chicago, LA, and things like that. Mm -hmm. We're talking about um, medevac helicopters, which oh. are dependent upon 
radio altimeters in order to provide that very important service to everybody if you're ever involved in a very unfortunate accident. So uh, the six months gives time at, at, for the FAA, uh, for the FCC mm -hmm. to further look at the problem and come up with solutions. And there are solutions that are available that the telecom uh, companies can engage in. For example, in the European Union, this isn't really an issue. Mm -hmm. Number one is because they use a different spectrum for 5G. Mm -hmm. It's further displaced from the frequencies that are used by radio altimeters. Mm -hmm. But also, it's a question of power, placement, and uh, um, uh, angle of the antenna. Antenna. Uh, so, uh, you know, they figured out this out in the EU, EU and they really need to uh, address that issue with the U.S. telecoms so that they can uh, adjust their power and angle of their antennas so you don't have these spurious signals being sent up into the air that could affect airplanes. Yeah, seems like a, a reasonable suggestion to share best practices, right? Sure. Okay, one other question. Um, so the, the like I guess we could call it the secondary airports. Um, they are not uh, they're not under any agreement or restrictions currently, right? Well, beyond the eighty eight airports that the that AT and T and Verizon have agreed not to put up the towers yet or turn them on, really. Yeah, uh, I, and would you say that they're sort of smaller airports? Well, sure, and I don't, I don't have the the list here, but there, you know, yeah. eighty eight major airports. Those are typically the the hubs and and major urban areas. But you know, if you're catching a flight to uh, um, a more rural area on a connect on a, a regional airline or on a connecting flight, then you know, again, you have the same issues that you would have otherwise. Yeah. By interference. Yeah, because I, I mean, I had read uh, that the smaller regional airlines, they have not received as many FAA clearances, um, I guess, as, you know, the, um, the, the big legacy carriers. So, you know, it's kind of like a double whammy there, you know. Um, well, regionals use a wider variety of aircraft and smaller aircraft. So, when, if you're Southwest, for example, and you're operating just 737, Boeing 737 aircraft, and you determine that the equipment works in, you know, 99% of your fleet uh, with, a, with a single uh, uh, test, mm -hmm. then, uh, you know, that clears a, a good portion of uh, uh, major air carriers just with that one airline. Mm -hmm. But if you're dealing with, uh, you know, Frontier. 120 regional airliners all using equipment that may be older, smaller, and of varying manufacturers and varying uh, uh, radio altimeter types mm -hmm. of manufacturers, then you have a, a real problem. Each one of those operators has to certify each one of those systems. Wow. Okay. So final words to travelers uh, who, are, who are hopefully planning a great trip this summer. What, what, are, what are your final words to them as a pilot? Well, the safety of the system is secure. That's Good. not going to be the issue. The issue is whether or not you are going to be inconvenienced with additional expense or disruption to your flight schedule when there's a situation with poor weather. Okay. And that's okay. a possibility until this issue gets resolved. Dean, thank you so much for your time. Listen, if, if uh, folks want to get in contact with you, should they just Google you? <laughs> Well, certainly that works. It seems to be almost <laughs> by me. That's but how I found you. <laughs> different different profiles uh, uh, online with uh, LinkedIn or yeah, or so and things like that. People um, can find me if they want to find me. There's not too many Dean Greenblatt's in this country. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna include a link to you uh, in in the story. Thank you so much for your time. It was a pleasure, Dean. Lisa, the pleasure was all mine. Thank you very much. Take care. <laughs>